It's hard to believe that this was the scene in Texas a couple days ago. Heavy snow coming down. Had about three inches altogether. There was quite a bit of melt due to the warm soil and the temperatures near freezing. And we are still left with some snow on the ground at this time. And on the surface map, haven't seen this in a long time, but high pressure covering the entire country. The highest pressure that we're seeing, 1037 millibars in Colorado and Utah, which indicates the presence of a plateau high. North of that high, we do have downslope conditions in Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas. So temperatures there quite a bit warmer than some places in Texas. I can see 52 there at Billings. And conditions going downhill in the northwestern U.S., getting some of that strong gradient off the Pacific, and that's bringing moisture, clouds, and some instability to that region. And looking up there in the Canadian high Arctic, Canada itself and Alaska, does not show very much cold air. Just a little bit there, minus 20s over Banks Island and possibly northern Victoria Island. So not very much Arctic air on tap, and the rest of it is just all typical cold air mass for this time of year. And I think down there in Manitoba, we could draw a warm front, maybe running something like that. And then probably a series of boundaries going back up towards the Berks Range, similar to that. So the air south of that, fairly mild for this time of year. And you can see that white horse, 21 degrees, almost near freezing. And up in Alaska, near Fairbanks, it's in the teens and even close to the 20s. To get a unique perspective on what's happening, we need to look at unique products. For today, I'm going to start out with the precipitable water product. This is showing a composite of the available water vapor in a vertical column above each point. So right in here where you see that little hint of purple, that's going to be some very high amounts of moisture throughout the entire column. Parts of that column may be dry. Other parts may be very moist. And this is showing a fetch of moisture coming right there on shore in Oregon and Northern California. We also see the presence of dry air across the southwestern U.S., and it looks like it has some extent southward into Baja, California, and into northern Mexico. And we know that that's in part due to the cold air that has filtered southward over the past week. And that's certainly been the case in Texas and along the Gulf Coast, where we've driven out a lot of the moisture. But it is lurking to the south there in Florida and just off the south Texas coast. The bulk of the tropical air, we find that in Jamaica, the Yucatan, and around Belize. Looking at the pressure patterns, we do see low pressure up in the Northwest Territories. A very deep low, nothing compared to last week though, but looks like it's in the 960s there in the Gulf of Alaska. And another low working its way, this looks like an occlusion, working its way towards Juneau and Ketchikan. And then up to the north, there's our polar high. It's way up there over the Beaufort Sea, connected into the Siberian high-pressure systems. And that's where our Arctic air is lurking. Now, for another unique perspective, we can look at the 850 millibar temperature. This shows us the distribution of air masses, and we can see some very cold air out there over the northern Pacific. Very likely, we've got a cold front, which extends southward from that low off the Alaskan Panhandle coast, probably runs south along the coast, maybe a wave in there somewhere, and looks like that extends southward, maybe like that. And then we would find a warm front, maybe not that far north, it could be a little bit further back, but what this is showing is the main frontal system is right there off the coast of Washington, Oregon, and British Columbia. And the colder air, we find that over the Aleutian Islands where we have this northwesterly gradient in place, and that's where the cold Arctic air is, up there over the ice pack. We can take a sample sounding right out here over the ice pack. 
No, we can't. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we're a little bit restricted on Pivotal Weather where we can click. We would probably have to choose an alternate product here, but that, that is where the Arctic air is, and it's going to be quite cold. You can see if we go up to 500 millibars, well, we don't have temperature at that level either. So if we go to Weather Nerds, yeah, we can get the temperatures at higher levels. So we'll go up to 500 millibars, and this view is a little bit distorted. I, I'm not a fan of the Mercator projection, but up there in the Arctic, you can see the cold air. And let's see if we can get, grab a sounding. And we can. This is going to be just off Banks Island. And you can see that inversion down there under 850 millibars. That's going to be the Arctic air itself. And then above that, that's going to be polar air. A little bit warmer, but still quite cold. And all this cold air up through the entire column adds up to very low thickness values. And there you can see the thickness values down to 498 to 504 over the Arctic ice pack. Now, where's the bitterly cold air? Maybe we need to take a look at the hemispheric plot. So to do that, we go to Pivotal Weather and click on this northern hemisphere. And for whatever reason, we're not given the thickness chart. However, by selecting 300 millibar height, we can isolate exactly where the polar vortex is, and that's going to correspond to the lower thickness values. That's going to be over Yakutsk, up to Tixi, and up into the Laptev Sea. So that's where cold air is, and what we're contending now with is this long jet stream. You can see it's funneling moisture and warmth into British Columbia and Washington, and that's the storm track we have for this week. And then just running this very quickly forward, you can see that zonal components start to break down. That may be some of that fallout from this southern stratospheric warming, the polar vortex breakdown. I don't think it's going to be as severe as what the media stories are running with, but it will have some effect in mixing things up a little bit. And there you can see a bit of blocking, maybe towards the end of the month. Very well-defined ridge there. However, these blocks and vortices, they're actually quite small. And what's going to happen, looks like according to the GFS, we're just going to keep that zonal component chugging along and maybe a few blocks out there in the Pacific. However, due to the high wavelength number, I think uh, things will keep moving and this may evolve into kind of a split flow pattern. And for California, I was just thinking back to a few months ago when we were looking at all those wildfires. It's kind of good that that's settled down. Things are stormy in Northern California. We've got gusty winds, occasional showers, and a south wind running through that region. However, there is a blocking ridge in place. We can see that when we animate the water vapor imagery. Right there, that's going to be an upper level ridge, and that's actually going to become significant as the week goes on. But along and up to the north of that, very strong westerly component, and with that strong westerly flow there going all the way back towards Japan, they're getting a setup for long swells coming from the west and northwest onto the coastal regions, and there are waves of 25 to even 30 feet forecast in that region. And there's how things look at 500 millibars, about midway in the troposphere, the 576 decameter line right there in central California, and watch how that builds as we get into Wednesday night. Now the 576 line way up there. So we've got pressure rises and ridging, and that's going to drive temperatures upward. So there's the evening temperatures for today. Lots of 60s and approaching 70 in Los Angeles. But by Wednesday, a little bit warmer. And then by Thursday, you can see some 80s popping up right there. So some spots may come up into the mid to upper 80s. And the way California has been kind of dry, we could see the wildfire potential start to return once again towards this weekend. 
things have quieted down in Texas, but you can see the snow field. Looks like south of Lubbock, they got quite a bit there. Places like Tahoma in Hobbs, they must have gotten quite a bit of accumulation. And of course, across East Texas, pretty good swath. And we can kind of trace that all the way up into Northeast Louisiana and Northern Mississippi where it has burned off this morning. Due to extensive cold advection stratocumulus across the southeast, we can't really make out the snow tracks very well, but I can certainly see it in the Blue Ridge Mountains out there in eastern North Carolina. That's going to be snow there, and I know that we did see on the METAR observation some snow fell around Huntsville. Looks like a lot of that has melted as well. A quick look up in the northeast U.S. shows cloudy conditions across the Great Lakes into New York. You can see some mid-level and upper-level clouds working across the area, indicating mid- and upper-level dynamics. However, this looks like a stagnant air mass. Let's take a look at a sounding at Buffalo. So without even looking at the surface map, we can break things down. Let's bring this up to the midday period. Click on the Buffalo area. And this will give us the story of what's happening. Inversion up at about 10,000 feet. That's going to be the top of the polar layer. So below that cold air, the coldest portion of it, at 850 millibars, about 5,000 feet. And surface temperatures, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see some modification of the air mass in the lowest layers. Tropopause, pretty high up there, about 250, 250 millibars, about 34,000 feet and the flow out of the west at pretty much all levels. And this is typically what we see when the air mass is starting to recover. Let's take a look at some METAR observations. We see some freezing rain and drizzle and snow kind of on the light side. And due to the southwesterly wind component, we've probably got lake effect snow taking place. The infrared imagery showing that most of the clouds around Buffalo and Detroit and Cincinnati, those are going to be low clouds. They're not showing up as excessively cold. The very cold clouds are going to be associated with the mid-level systems like that one and these right here. And these are likely short waves moving through the flow and helping to produce a little bit of vertical motion right there in Buffalo. And there's the radar for Buffalo. Precipitation is definitely light, not showing much more than about 5 to 10 dBZs, and those are going to be shallow convective clouds with just some very light lift. So just a quick look at the forecast. We're looking at the European model, which has just come in. We got a cutoff low over Texas that's going to be associated with the remains of the cold air in that region. That's going to be similar to the cutoff lows that we often see out in California. Couple ridges up to the north, and and then as we get into Thursday and Friday, we see this 150 knot jet coming out of Montana. That'll probably drive some cold air southward. Now we know from the surface analysis that there's just not much cold air up there. If there was, we would be looking at an Arctic outbreak, but there's not that cold air up there. So this is just going to reinforce what we already have in place. Then going into the weekend, that kind of closes off into a low over the Midwest. The polar front jet kind of rounds, goes right around that low. And where we expect to see the surface systems, that's going to be upstream from this ridge, downstream from this trough. So we're going to be looking for inclement conditions this weekend around Georgia. This would suggest maybe a frontal system kind of like that heading for the northeast. Then moving forward into Saturday and Sunday, things move quickly offshore. Here comes another reinforcing shot of cold air coming south. Not very much of it. Looks like my page stopped loading or something. Anyway, we're not going to worry about that too much. Let's go down to the surface and put it all together. So there's our outgoing high pressure in Texas. That's the remains of that cold air. So we're going to see less and less of that over the days ahead. And then we, we reestablish this westerly 
gradient across much of the U.S. Here comes a new system out, out of Alberta. That's probably what we're looking for to come southeastward. That's going to be an Alberta clipper there. So there's the leading edge for Thursday morning. Probably a front like that. Possibly an occlusion going north. So this is a Another dose of cold air coming south, sweeps quickly through Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, late Thursday, some snow up there in the Minnesota, Wisconsin region. And as you can see, we get this very minor nor'easter coming up the coast. At least that's the way it looks according to the European model. Yeah, possibly some very good snows up there in New England. And that'll be gone and we're left with another remnant of cold air, and then the next big change. It's probably going to be this developing system down there off the Texas coast for Wednesday the 20th. Just enough wet bulbing and dry air, cold air advection, feeding into the backside to get this mixed bag of precip going around Dallas and Abilene, according to the European model, and then things move northeastward. So possibly a bit of wintry weather for the Carolinas, in the middle of next week. Nothing big after that, really. Things look active on the California coast. That's probably good news for them. And I think that's where I'll stop. Two, 240 hours, that's about the limit of re reliability of these numerical models this time of year, especially when we've got a changeover in the hemispheric pattern. So, yeah, it looks a little bit quiet over the next week or two, but a little bit of weather punctuating that silence every now and then. All right, that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank our newest supporter, Steve DuBose. Welcome to the program, and like all supporters, you will get access to the private Monday video. So enjoy that. And as for everybody, have a great Tuesday, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.